job today is to make sure you don't fall asleep. So uh, we've been doing some research on dual purpose crops uh, and we've started using some cattle on that. My background is an agronomist by trade, so I tended to grow the crops, um, but we've had a few experiments with cattle grazing on it. So I just want to, because I'm not uh, entirely sure in the audience today what your experience of dual purpose crops is, so I just want to define it a little bit uh, and we'll talk about some basic agronomy of dual purpose crops uh, and then we'll get to some more specifics around the cattle. So dual purpose crops, where the name comes from is that you're getting more than one uh, purpose out of it. So traditionally a grain only crop, uh, the main season of sowing was May and we're thinking mainly about wheat here. Uh, and down here in southern New South Wales, uh, we're probably looking at harvest at the end of November. Your harvest has probably crept forward a little bit further than that. So when we start thinking about dual purpose crops, uh, we tend to sow them a little bit earlier and I'll probably encourage you to sow them uh, a bit earlier than that. And I'm just looking at my watch, 23rd of March today. If it wasn't raining down here, it'd be good to be on the tractor to sow some of these things. But we get an extensive period of being able to uh, graze these crops in the winter time. And in many respects, we've been able to remove what we would have called uh, the winter feed deficit, particularly in the mixed farming zone. So I guess today I want to think about, I'm not sure, there may be some people in the audience today who class themselves as mixed farmers, and there might be others uh, who see themselves purely as beef cattle producers with very little cropping on their farms. I want to introduce dual purpose crops for beef because I think there could be an opportunity uh, for if you are just a beef producer to utilise some of these crops on farms of your neighbours or friends or those sort of things, but always at a price. The key thing about dual purpose crop is we get the grazing period, but we also get grain at the end. And if everything's done pretty well, your grain yield will be the same as a grain only crop. So why do we want to graze beef cattle on dual purpose crops? And to be honest, there's been lots of work done with the sheep industry and within the mixed farming zone, sheep enterprises tend to be the uh, largest proportion of that. So why do we want to graze beef? Well, part of that is because uh, there is a very large potential area that we can sow dual purpose crops. Uh, it's kind of limited though by the sheep industry. When a, when a producer has sheep, uh, a ewe flock on their farm, let's say it's 2,000 ewes, at the time when we can utilise these crops, either they're in late pregnancy or they've just dropped their lambs on the ground uh, in that period, and it's difficult to increase the stocking rate. It's difficult to go to the market and buy more livestock. Whereas for the beef cattle, uh, there's a chance that there's some yielding cattle uh, running around that need a home, particularly from out of some of those hill areas where people uh, might struggle to feed them during that winter period. So what I'm suggesting here is that this period could be used for beef cattle to increase your stocking rate, make the most of excess or extra forage that you could grow on farm, or if you're already a beef producer, uh, look at these options that you could go uh, and maybe adjust some cattle for a time uh, on a farm uh, to get some really cheap feed. So what are the opportunities? Well, what we've done in a couple of experiments that we've seen, we're getting growth rates exceeding sort of two kilograms per head per day. Now, uh, this tends to be on young cattle and that's, that's what I wanna uh, put before you today. So we're talking sort of that 200 to maybe 300 kilo sort of yearling cattle. Not imagining this is for cows per se, uh, in the sense that we're talking about very high quality feed and uh, we wanna utilize that best in terms of a growing animal. If I do the gross margins down here in Southern New South Wales uh, for some of these cattle enterprises, you end up with being about 340 to almost $1,000 per hectare just for the cattle enterprise. So that is, in this situation, it's a, a trading stock um, system where you buy them in. And so in terms of doing an Excel budget, it was buying in price, selling off price, transport, commission fees, uh, potential deaths and all those kinds of things. And there are growers down here that would have probably exceeded that $1,000 mark per hectare last year. 
And so there's an opportunity to add extra income uh, into your farming system. Now, if I did some back of the envelope uh, calculations on this about what the percentage uh, or number of cattle that we could use. Well, in Southern Australia, and I use Southern Australia in comparison to the Northern Australian cattle uh, industry. So I'm sort of thinking from Southern Queensland right down into Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, there is a potential to feed an extra 2.2 million cattle. Some of that's in the high rainfall zone, but a large proportion of that's in that mixed farming, the sheep wheat belt. If they increase their dual purpose crops by just another 10%, uh, right across that southern part of the nation, we can feed a significant amount of cattle. So one of the things I want to do for you today is to, in some ways, present an opportunity. What I'm presenting to you, if you're a cattle producer, is that there is a source of pretty cheap feed out there in that winter period that you could utilise. If you're a mixed farmer, uh, maybe buying in stock, maybe adjusting uh, stock from people you know, could provide extra income from a crop uh, that you're already preparing to grow. And so I just want you to think about for your own farming system, what are the opportunities for you? What I'm saying is that for months of June, July, and into beginning of August, depending on the season, uh, you can have a very high quality feed uh, for those months, which can lead to high growth rates. So let's just go through some dual purpose crop agronomy. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with some of these things, so I want to touch on the basics and I'm happy to take questions towards the end. So when are we likely to sow these things? Well, the first thing to think about is good summer weed management and clean paddocks. Okay, uh, this is not just scratching a few like we would have done in the old, it's just scratching a few oats and it will be fine. We wanna make sure we've got good summer weed management. What does it allow? It allows early sowing because we've stored moisture and we've stored nitrogen in the soil. And the longer our crop systems grow for, oftentimes the more difficult weeds are. So clean paddocks is really quite handy. For Southern New South Wales, I'm thinking wheat being uh, from mid-March onwards and canola, I'm happy to go a little bit earlier and it might depend on your system there. And I'll talk about canola uh, a little bit later on and how that may or may not fit in your system. But what I'm talking about here are true winter cultivars. These are ones that will not flower until they go through a cold period. So the classic for wheat is uh, wedge tail at the moment. Uh, canola, there's only really a couple of cultivars out there uh, to do this. Uh, and I th what is it, Hyola 970, a clear field type. And so it allows the opportunity for an early sowing. Those early sowings, you've got to have a good profile of moisture to go with. So it does depend on the autumn break as well, uh, when you can get these things in the ground. I generally encourage higher sowing rates uh, to maximize forage production. Sufficient nitrogen uh, is important. Uh, we'll talk, we might mention a little bit later some nitrate toxicity, but these plants, these crops do need nitrogen to be able to produce the forage that you are interested in. So we shouldn't skimp on the nitrogen. And just to show you, if I jump back, here's a, a little graph to give you some of these indications. Uh, this is some older modeling work that I did and on an old cultivar of canola, it was actually a spring type. But here, if we just look at this example, uh, this is sowing date from left to right, 1st of April to June. And you can clearly see in each of these, all right, the earlier we sow, the more forage we can produce, that's clear cut. Uh, as we increase our sowing rates here, we'll tend to get more biomass and this figure over on the right is about nitrogen. Uh, and so the levels of nitrogen, and this is in a modeling context, so it probably doesn't quite uh, convey to the field, but we need the right amount of nitrogen to get sufficient amount of biomass. If we skimp on nitrogen, we're really uh, cutting ourselves short in terms of forage production. 
So when to graze? Well, really it's when the crop survives what we'd describe as the twist test. Canola, you're probably looking at six to eight leaves. Maybe it's a little bit later with cattle in terms of just the way that cattle eat those crops with their tongue uh, and pulling it. You can probably leave it a little bit later than that. Wheat, generally with sheep, we'd say sort of four, four to five leaf stage. But once again, you probably want to be a bit later than that with cattle as well. But you just got to make sure that those animals won't pull it out of the ground. Often, not always, but often canola will be grazed first in the system if you've got canola and wheat. So here's the twist test. Just grab a plant, try and pull it out of the ground. If it comes away easily, just you need to delay the grazing sort of period. One of the most critical aspects around dual purpose crops is when to remove the livestock. And this is all about maintaining yield. Now you could make a decision to graze the crop out and that would be purely based on economic reasons and that may be the best decision for your situation. But when we're talking about dual purpose crops, we're generally assuming uh, that we want grain yield and we want any losses in grain yield to be minimized. We want it to yield the same as what a, an equivalent ungrazed crop may yield. So when to stop grazing? Well, it's growth stage 30. So you might've heard in wheat, Zadox 30. Uh, and really that is about the start of stem extension. As soon as that stem starts to elongate, you need to remove those livestock. Now we can get a bit trickier about that. We could leave them on a little bit longer if we've got more forage, but if we wanna to keep to the basics, uh, we wanna get them off its stem extension. Now I've got some approximate dates here, but uh, mid-July and sort of beginning of August. For being in the Northwest, I'm gonna say that maybe they come forward a little bit uh, in terms of when those dates are. So it's really important for you or your agronomist to be out in that paddock and having a look for when that stem extension starting to make sure livestock are removed. So here's a wheat plant and it's pretty simple. You just pull out the main stem, uh, from the wheat plant, turn it upside down, get your uh, pocket knife out and cut it straight down the middle, divide it up in half. And here you can see, so this is the tip of, you can see there's a tip here. This is what's gonna turn into the head of wheat. Uh, and you can see uh, the nodes are starting to appear and it's more than a centimetre from the base of the stem. So it's starting to move away the growing point of the plant is starting to move away from the soil. At this point, it comes uh, a risk to being grazed out. And if that's grazed out, it is likely that you'll get significant yield loss. With canola, it's a little bit straightforward. You'll have these rosette stage and you'll start to see in the middle, you'll start to get some stem elongation. Uh, here on the right hand side, you can see the buds at the top. That's far too late. They're likely to graze that off, but you want to as soon as it starts to elongate, you wanna start pulling the livestock off. So I've got a bit of a list here to think about, and I've already mentioned some of these, agronomy for dual purpose crops. Paddock selection is really important. Just don't pick any old paddock and have a go. Uh, make sure it's the right paddock. Control the summer weeds, select appropriate cultivars. Okay, don't pick a spring type cultivar if you're going to sow uh, much, much earlier than the normal sowing window. So it's really important you use the right cultivar for the right job. Sow early with one of those winter type cultivars because sowing earlier, because there's more heat around, develops greater leaf area, it produces more biomass. And so one of the things after these, uh, the rain has sort of cleared, I'd be saying, let's get going on those dual purpose crops because the sooner we get them in, the more forage we'll be able to produce. We do need nitrogen to produce some forage. Uh, and grazing when they can't be pulled from the ground, finish grazing at stem elongation. When I'm thinking about stocking rates as a rough estimate, if we think 200 kilo uh, weight of cattle, okay, you're sort of looking, depending on the amount of forage, two to three head per hectare. Okay, it can kind of sustain that for a longer period of time. Uh, and, and top dress nitrogen after grazing. And so that's all about the risk of, uh, nitrate toxicity and so only apply nitrogen at sowing or after the grazing period. So there's been some negative health aspects on dual purpose crops uh, and nitrate toxicity is one and that's the classic one that people are aware of and my experience is that hasn't tend to be as important. 
acidosis is a risk. And for most growers, they'll normally associate that with feeding grain. The quality of the forage that we're feeding to these livestock is kind of like grain. And so there's the risk of acidosis, which can lead to some uh, higher susceptibility to some bloat. So we're not talking about legume bloat here, uh, but it's still a bloat that can kill them. And the last one is this polyemphysomalacia, or PEM as it's easy to pronounce. And that's related to sulfur in the diet, particularly with canola. Uh, and it can prevent the bacteria in the rumen from producing vitamin B1 or thiamine. And we can come back and talk about those if you want. So we had two questions for uh, cattle on dual purpose crops. One, does mineral supplement increase live weight gain on dual purpose crops? It's been done for sheep and it's shown as a clear benefit. Uh, does that work in cattle? And can animal health concerns be managed on dual purpose crops, particularly those ones that we just mentioned? Now, I'm just gonna skip through these reasonably quickly because I think time is running away. So mineral supplement, what are we talking about? Generally, we're talking about a one to one to one by weight mix of uh, salt, uh, lime, and a product called Causmag or that's high in magnesium. And we just put that in open trays. It's a loose leaf, animals go in and they can use it. So when we did this with grazing cattle, uh, we had our first uh, period and we almost achieved two kilos uh, of average daily gain in these livestock, but that was for the no supplement livestock. When we compared that to the ones that received supplement, uh, they got an extra boost of about 500 grams per day. Okay, if we put that in perspective, these animals, uh, the cost of that lick per animal is about four and a half cents per day, depending on livestock prices. Uh, if it's five kilos of live weight, uh, five kilos or five dollars per kilo live weight, you're thinking around um, an extra $2.50. So it makes clear sense to add supplement. In this experiment, the second period, we didn't really get any difference. And that was because this crop had been allowed to elongate and quality started to decline. So there's been, really, there's only been three experiments across the country uh, with this. Uh, one was done at Corindai, one, another one at Southern, in Southern Queensland. And for two out of the three experiments, differences were found, okay? And so it might not always be the case, but the reality is it's so cheap to do and the benefits can be large, uh, it's just an obvious thing. If you're grazing wheat with beef cattle, okay, add some supplements. Can animal health concerns be managed on dual purpose canola? One of the risks with cattle on, uh, on canola is around that animal health. Cattle tend to be more susceptible to a range of animal health issues. Uh, and so we've had some issues down in Southern and Central New South Wales. And so we wanted to know, because the suggestion is you need to adapt these cattle onto these crops. And so we tried to push the adaptation period. So in this experiment, week one, uh, these first three were going through various adaptation. The blue was just put straight on the crop. The green had four days of adaptation. Red had uh, seven days of adaptation. So they were going through that adaptation stage. And the yellow ones uh, were just on a mixed ration and hadn't been introduced to the field. What we noticed in week two, is that these couple had adapted to the crop already and the yellow one has all disappeared. One of the key features of animals or livestock grazing canola is that you'll have a lag phase. And that means as the rumen adjusts over a period of a week and a week and a half, that you will uh, have relatively low live weight gain. But as they were ad adjusted to it, uh, we had pretty good live weights. So if we put a line through there, some weeks were over two kilos per day. On average, over that five week period for all those treatments, we average uh, 1.75 kilos per head per day. But we need to think when we're doing canola, we need to be grazing for four to five weeks uh, to catch up for that lag period that happens at the beginning. We had no real acute animal health problems with grazing that. So we managed to kind of dodge that bullet. The question is, is some of those uh, health issues will surprise. And in the questions we can talk about uh, maybe how we can deal with nitrate toxicity, uh, the PEM issue and, and bloat. But if I was to give you some best bet canola grazing options, reducing pre-sulfur uh, fertilizers, uh, 
And we don't really know if this is the best thing to do, but it's kind of a best bet at the moment in terms of the PEM is related to high sulfur within the canola. And so we're trying to mitigate that risk and we're doing some work around that. Ensure cattle are well fed. That's just always ensure that cattle are well fed. The worst outcomes we get are when hungry cattle uh, or they're on very short pastures are introduced to these crops and they gorge themselves. Uh, and then we run into problems very quickly and we end up with tens of cattle dying after those. Introduce the crop mid to late morning. Okay, so cattle will tend to eat a large proportion of their daily intake early in the morning. So if you let them graze outside the crop earlier on when you're first introducing them, they'll already have a rumen that's partially full of other material. So it sort of dilutes that down. And I'm still suggesting we adapt these livestock over time to try and minimize any of these outcomes. And I'm saying a period of about a week is probably sufficient but you need to make sure that you watch them and you need to make sure that they're actually eating the crop. Some of the negative outcomes that I've heard about are people introducing them to the crop and the animals have actually avoided the crop for a number of days. They've eaten everything else out in the paddock, all the non-arable areas, then they've got hungry and then one morning they've woken up and thought, uh, I'm just gonna try the canola. And so they will gorge themselves on the canola and so, five, six days after being introduced to the canola paddock, you've suddenly got a number of dead animals. Normally we've found low nitrate levels in the leaf of canola. What do I mean by the leaf? The, just the green part. Okay, so nitrate tends to, nitrate tends to accumulate in the petiole or the stems or the midrib. And so if there's high forage available, in the canola, it is able for those cattle just to go and sort of nibble the green parts of the leaves and we've reduced the risk of nitrate. If we push them really hard and they eat large proportion of stems, uh, we're likely to increase the chance of nitrate toxicity. And over time, through the adaptation period, livestock will tend to become uh, more tolerant of the nitrate levels in those plants. We're still saying for canola, always provide hay in the paddock. Uh, just, just as a risk management strategy. To be honest, in the wheat paddocks, I'm not too concerned about providing them hay. What you can end up doing is diluting this high quality feed. So you just achieve a lower live weight gain. But in canola, we're still not 100% confident of just putting them on without the hay. It's a risk management strategy. And this, we come back to this point, during the adjustment period, the cattle need to eat the crop. Okay, you need to be out there looking at them, observing what they're doing. If they haven't started eating the crop, they're not adjusted to the crop. So take home messages, cattle's been grazed on dual purpose crops. I want you to think about what are the opportunities that you have to utilize dual purpose crops to really get rid of that uh, winter, feed deficit. It just completely removes it. You won't be having to uh, hand feed lots of hay or silage at that time of year. If you've got dual purpose crops, they can graze it themselves. It really uh, changes the system in that sense. Grazing wheat, just to include a mineral supplement. And really it's only for wheat. Oats is different, barley is different again, uh, but for wheat, just do the mineral supplement. One to one to one by weight, salt, lime, uh, magnesium cause mag product. And we can graze canola safely. So it can be done, but much greater attention needs to be paid uh, to those livestock as you're grazing it to make sure that it works. So these uh, were Angus beef steers. And I'm gonna say, I think their average weight was around that 230 kilos. Um, We've run a few of these experiments now, but we're always operating within that two to 300 kilo live weight. Uh, these guys uh, these guys had been on a, an adjustment and were probably a bit tight uh, when they came on. So there, there's definitely some compensatory growth here. So I'm not gonna say that uh, you'll get in excess of two kilos per head per day um, every time, but, I'd be confident that you'd definitely be approaching that two kilos, uh, particularly with, with adding in the supplement. And so uh, you've got to think 
Uh, the quality of this forage is much higher than a uh, perennial grass. Uh, it's probably more like a, well, I guess a, a rye grass. Um, it's more, it's, I mean, particularly the canola, it's approaching sort of metabolizable energy levels of, of grain. And so, uh, and good protein levels, there's nothing really limiting them here in terms of their live weight gain. Yeah, so not as much work's been done on the barley. And part of that is because pretty much, I think all of the barley cultivars are, are your classic spring types. And so they, I mean, the reason barley is sown later in a normal season is because it goes the head, uh, relatively speaking, a lot quicker than the wheat. So there's no reason you can't graze a spring uh, cultivar but your period of grazing will be much, much reduced. And so some guys are doing some of those spring cultivars in the uh, larger paddock areas, in the dry areas of the mixed farming area where, and they're not grazing as much. It's really what some of them call clip grazing. The animals are just walking through, it's very low density. They're just grabbing a bite here and there. Um, so that's one of the main differences. So when you pick your wheat cultivar, you need something that is a winter type. So wedge tail is the classic one. Whereas most of the main season wheats that we have are spring types, which really need to be sown uh, pretty accurately within their sowing window, otherwise they'll go to head. In terms of mineral supplementation, uh, there hasn't been much work done on that. I don't think the barley has responded in, in such the same way as the wheat has. Wheat is classic in that it actually excludes uh, sodium at its roots. So the, the amount of sodium within the plant itself isn't high enough to uh, enable growth to actually happen. And so depending on your system, if you're looking for longer periods of grazing a dual purpose crop during that winter, you'd be definitely, if it's a cereal, you'd be going to the wheat uh, because that's the cultivars that are available to us.